Alia is a sneaky Russian girl who hides her feelings, but is secretly in love with the lazy boy in the class. If you enjoy my recaps, go ahead and click the like button, subscribe, and smash the notification bell. Masachika is what you'd call the classic underdog, an awkward, unattractive otaku who spends more time immersed in anime than interacting with people. His existence flies under the radar until the unthinkable happens. The most popular girl in school, Alia, inexplicably falls for him. Alia isn't just any popular girl, though. She's the queen bee, the girl who turns heads wherever she goes, with students practically worshipping the ground she walks on. She's so dazzling that even a single glance from her can make someone's day or crush them entirely. One morning, the most coveted boy in school, a Timothy Chalamet lookalike who believes his $2 haircut is enough to woo any girl, musters the confidence to approach Alia. He's certain his charm will win her over, but Alia instantly shuts him down, rejecting him in front of everyone. The poor guy, desperate to save face, tries to pivot, asking for her number in a last-ditch effort. But Alia isn't having it. She hits him where it hurts, bluntly telling him she's not even remotely interested. His ego crumbles as the rest of the school watches in stunned silence, realizing that if this king of popularity couldn't land a date with her, they surely stand no chance either. Later that day, Alia waltzes into class and finds Misachika, the unassuming otaku, catching up on some sleep at his desk. Irritated, she wakes him up with a kick and scolds him, asking if he stayed up all night watching anime again. Misachika admits to it without shame, explaining that it was for something important. Alia rolls her eyes, thinking he was probably involved in some Twitter drama or stuck in an endless online argument. But when she discovers that he actually stayed up just to binge watch anime recaps, she calls him insane. Misachika laughs it off, saying that for the sake of anime culture, he'd proudly wear a straitjacket. Their banter doesn't stop there. As Misachika lets out a huge yawn, wide enough to fit an eggplant, Alia mockingly comments in Russian that he looks pathetic. Confused but curious, Misachika asks what she said. With a smirk, Alia dismissively tells him that it doesn't matter. First period is chemistry, a class that coincidentally mirrors the bubbling tension between them. Misachika, naturally, forgets his textbook and ends up sharing Alia's. As the teacher drones on about the lesson, Misachika battles his exhaustion, struggling to stay awake. Annoyed, Alia pokes him with her pen, causing him to jolt and raise his hand. The teacher calls on him to answer a question, and in a panic, Misachika turns to Alia for help. She points at something, so Misachika confidently repeats it. Unfortunately, it's completely wrong. The teacher sighs and asks Alia for the correct answer, which she gives effortlessly, making Misachika feel betrayed. When he accuses her of throwing him under the bus, Alia just grins mischievously, insisting she was only pointing at the question number. But what Alia doesn't know is that Misachika has a secret. He's been able to understand her Russian all along. Ever since his childhood, when he used to play with a Russian girl, he had picked up enough of the language to follow along with Alia's sarcastic quips. All this time, Alia had been calling him cute in Russian, and it completely messes with his head. He's left questioning her every move, trying to figure out if she's teasing him or genuinely interested. However, he chooses to keep his knowledge of Russian a secret, knowing that if Alia found out, she'd probably die of embarrassment, and Misachika isn't ready to deal with that level of drama. Later in the day, Alia catches Misachika using his phone during class, which is strictly forbidden unless there's an emergency. She snatches it out of his hand, curious to see what's so important. When she sees a picture of an anime girl with silver hair, she rolls her eyes and hands the phone back, muttering in Russian that her own hair is silver too. Misachika catches the comment, but when he asks her about it, she simply brushes it off and calls him a game junkie. Misachika, of course, spirals into an unnecessary tangent about how he's not a real junkie because he doesn't even have a Twitch stream yet. Alia can't help but feel that there's no hope for him. During lunch, Misachika and his friends sit together, watching as the student council enters the cafeteria. Alia, who serves as the treasurer, walks in alongside her sister Maria and their spokesperson Yuki. The boys can't stop ogling the Kujo sisters, acknowledging that they're way out of everyone's league. Misachika remains uninterested until Yuki, noticing his lack of reaction, suggests they sit with him and his friends. The boys, despite being intimidated, agree. As the group settles in, Yuki and Misachika share a lighthearted conversation about their shared distaste for cafeteria food. Meanwhile, Alia watches them with a look of disdain, though she remains quiet for most of the meal. Yuki later asks Misachika if he's thought about joining the student council, but Misachika laughs and says he'd rather watch that terrible 2010 Airbender movie that no one likes to talk about. Yuki points out that Misachika was her vice president back in middle school and had been very capable, but Alia, switching to Russian, mutters that Yuki doesn't need to tell her how competent Misachika is. Later, Yuki says her goodbyes and Alia says she's surprised any girl would.
One befriends with the Masachika points out that she's his friend, which surprises Elia who agrees, and suddenly walks away, leaving Masachika confused. As the day progresses, Masachika's mind drifts back to his childhood memories of the blonde Russian girl who had inspired him to learn the language. He remembers how dedicated he was back then, studying Russian just to be able to communicate with her. Yet, frustratingly, he can't remember her name. The next day, Masachika arrives at school early and surprises everyone by tidying up the classroom. Alia is the first to arrive and is shocked to find Masachika actually awake and functional before class starts. She comments sarcastically that hell must have frozen over. Masachika, noticing some dirt on her socks, asks if she stepped in a puddle, but Alia explains that she had been splashed with mud by a passing truck on her way to school. Trying to brush off her embarrassment, Alia awkwardly asks if Masachika has reconsidered joining the student council. Once again, he flatly refuses, joking that he'd rather swallow nails. Alia changes the subject, but her nerves get the best of her, and she ends up flustered. She begins removing her dirty socks, and Masachika, flustered himself, can't help but stare. Noticing his reaction, Alia playfully suggests he fetch her a spare pair of socks from her locker. Masachika reluctantly agrees, but when she teases him to put the socks on for her, he panics and hesitates. Alia, however, insists, telling him it would be a reward for helping her out. As Masachika nervously complies, he accidentally brushes against a sensitive spot, and Alia reflexively kicks him in the face, sending him tumbling. Despite the pain, Masachika's inner otaku deems it worth the suffering. Later, when he tries to apologize, Alia brushes him off again, calling him a leg fetish scum in Russian. However, she also confesses that she isn't actually mad at him and even apologizes for kicking him. When she checks if he's okay, Masachika awkwardly dodges the question and thanks her for giving him a glimpse of heaven. This only embarrasses Alia further, leading to a playful chase around the school as she tries to escape her own flustered feelings. Eventually, they both cool down, and Masachika offers Alia her favorite drink as a peace offering. Touched that he remembered such a small detail, Alia switches to Russian and shyly asks if he wants a sip. Realizing this could be a chance for an indirect kiss, Masachika freezes up, overwhelmed by the prospect. Instead of seizing the moment, he chickens out and pretends not to understand. As usual, Alia laughs to herself, thinking he's still clueless about her Russian comments, completely unaware that Masachika has been following her every word all along. Several days later, Masachika finds himself in a storage room helping Yuki, the two of them goofing around as usual. Suddenly, Alia appears from behind a pile of boxes, her presence catching them both off guard. She playfully laments about always being the third wheel in these situations, making Masachika blush awkwardly. The girls quickly redirect him to help with their original task, sorting out the storage space. Masachika dutifully starts by bringing down a pile of board games, which gives Yuki the perfect opportunity to gloat about her last victory. Rolling her eyes, Alia chimes in, calling them a cringy couple before telling them to focus and get back to work. Then, in Russian, she mutters under her breath, wishing someone would pay attention to her too. Masachika shivers at the unexpected vulnerability in her voice, secretly understanding every word, but chooses not to react. Alia, oblivious to his comprehension, continues to think she's being sly. After cleaning up the storage room, the group heads to the student council office where the student council president, Kenzaki, introduces himself to Masachika. Kenzaki is impressive with the charisma and confidence of a leader, though Masachika internally compares him to an unfinished art project, wondering how someone so scatterbrained ended up in charge. As Masachika prepares to make a quick exit, Kenzaki insists on treating him to dinner as a gesture of gratitude for his help. Masachika, ever the introvert, tries to decline, but Yuki encourages him to accept, joking that his only plans for the evening involve meeting tumbleweeds at home. Kenzaki, perplexed by her strange metaphor, wonders aloud how Yuki knows what Masachika's home life is like, but she just smirks and says they go way back. Kenzaki extends the dinner invitation to the girls as well, and they both agree to join. At the restaurant, Kenzaki praises the group for finishing the storage room cleanup so efficiently. Yuki, as usual, takes the chance to hype up Masachika, crediting him with their success. Impressed, Kenzaki asks if Masachika would consider joining the student council, but Masachika declines with a laugh, saying he'd rather step on a Lego. Kenzaki, persistent, argues that being on the council would significantly boost Masachika's recommendations for university, but Masachika remains disinterested, more focused on recommending his favorite manga series to anyone who would listen. As the conversation flows, Yuki adds to the pressure, pestering Masachika about why he's being so stubborn. Masachika finally asks why Yuki is so intent on him joining when she's practically guaranteed to win the election. But Kenzaki drops a bombshell, 
revealing that Alia is planning to run for student council president as well. This revelation shocks Masachika, but Alia confirms her intention to run, her voice filled with determination. After dinner, Kenzaki slyly suggests that Masachika walk Alia home while he takes care of Yuki. The group splits up, and as Masachika walks alongside Alia, he notices that she's unusually quiet and distant. When they reach her stop, Alia simply waves goodbye and leaves without her usual playful banter or a single word in Russian, leaving Masachika confused and concerned. Back at home, Masachika senses something is off the moment he steps inside. Sure enough, Yuki is casually lounging on his couch, flipping through a manga. When he questions her presence, she ignores him, fully absorbed in a chapter featuring a couple from Alabama. Masachika calls her out on pretending to be childhood friends in front of everyone at school, but Yuki retorts that being siblings doesn't contradict the narrative she's created. With that out of the way, they focus on the manga she's reading, discussing its cultured content and exchanging lighthearted banter. The next morning, Masachika wakes up to find Yuki sprawled across him in bed. He groggily pushes her off, quipping that he's not interested in going full Targaryen with her. Later, the two head to the mall, where Yuki browses through clothes while Masachika feels a growing sense of dread as he checks the price tags. As they shop, Masachika mentions noticing a silver-haired figure lurking at the edge of his vision. Yuki, always a step ahead, tells him she noticed the peeping Tom long before. When they finally confront the mystery figure, it turns out to be none other than Alia. Trying to play it cool, Alia claims she just happened to run into them, but neither Masachika nor Yuki by her excuse. Yuki invites Alia to lunch with them, but Masachika tries to dissuade her, knowing the restaurant serves notoriously spicy food. Alia, undeterred by his warnings, insists on joining them. Moments later, she finds herself staring at a dish that could easily be mistaken for a bowl of molten lava. Despite Masachika's concern, Alia stubbornly digs in, only to immediately regret it as the fiery spices assault her senses. In a mix of pride and desperation, Alia switches to Russian, tearfully begging for help but refusing Masachika's offers whenever he tries to assist her. Meanwhile, Yuki, ever the troublemaker, eggs Alia on, offering to make her meal even spicier. Masachika sees through Yuki's ploy but is powerless to stop the chaos. Alia, determined not to back down, pours the extra spice into her dish, resulting in her screaming out in pain. After they finally escape the restaurant, Masachika offers to buy Alia some ice cream to cool down. As they walk, Masachika, curious about her motivation, asks why she wants to run for student council president. Alia shrugs off the question at first, saying she doesn't need a reason to aim high. However, in a rare moment of vulnerability, she quietly admits that she doesn't have a running mate yet. Masachika asks if she's planning to run alone, and Alia jokes that she might just recruit a random stranger to meet the requirements. But in Russian, she confesses that she wishes Masachika would run alongside her. Her words stir an old memory in Masachika, reminding him of a time when he saw a girl cry after losing an election, leaving him with a pang of sympathy for Alia. As they finish up their day, Alia drags Masachika along to do some more shopping. He protests at first but then realizes that Alia doesn't have many close friends because of her seemingly perfect but prickly demeanor. Feeling a bit sorry for her, Masachika agrees to accompany her. They browse through various stores, with Alia growing increasingly frustrated, suspecting that Masachika's kindness stems from pity. When she tries on a particularly stylish outfit, she hopes to impress him, but before she can show off, she has a sudden moment of panic, worried that he won't react at all. Finally, Alia steps out of the changing room, and Masachika, to her relief, compliments her outfit with unexpected sincerity. Flustered by his genuine praise, Alia retreats back into the stall, unsure how to handle the sudden surge of emotions. Determined to impress him further, she tries on outfit after outfit, each time seeking his approval. Eventually, she attempts a more daring look, hoping to tease him with a bit of skin, but when she opens the curtain, she's shocked to find Yuki standing there instead of Masachika. Embarrassed, Alia switches to Russian, wishing she could disappear. Masachika, overhearing her, translates the comment for Yuki, who teasingly calls Alia a big baby. On the train ride home, Alia silently stews over everything that happened, from the skimpy outfit she wore to her awkward interactions with Masachika. But as she watches him and Yuki exchange goodbyes, a more pressing thought invades her mind. Why did Masachika and Yuki get off at the same station? After huh? a long day, Alia returns home where her sister, Maria, greets her with a warm smile. However, 
Maria quickly notices that Alia seems to be in an unusually melancholic mood, something out of character for her typically composed sister. Sensing an opportunity to get to the bottom of things, Maria gently probes her about what's going on. Alia tries to brush it off, but eventually lets it slip that it has something to do with Misachika, her peculiar classmate. Maria's eyes immediately light up with excitement, thrilled at the thought that perhaps, after all these years, a boy might have finally pierced through Alia's impenetrable emotional armor. Alia, however, scoffs at the idea and firmly insists that her relationship with Misachika is strictly platonic. They're just friends, nothing more. Maria arches an eyebrow, unconvinced. She can't help but wonder aloud how Alia, the queen of being selective with people, could even manage to be friends with someone like Misachika, a notorious slacker whom Alia usually would have no patience for. Alia hesitates but eventually begins recounting the story of how they met, taking Maria back six years to their time in Russia. It all started when Alia's class was split into groups for a project. The winners were promised an enticing prize, and Alia, being the perfectionist she was, was determined to excel. She went above and beyond, traveling into town to conduct interviews and compile her research. But when she returned to school, ready to contribute, she found her group completely indifferent to the project's success. Her classmates, future couch potatoes in the making, didn't share her drive and mocked her for working too hard. Alia's efforts were dismissed, and despite her attempts to rally the group, she found herself working solo, essentially writing a dissertation for an assignment that should have been a team effort. The prize went to another group, leaving Alia devastated and questioning why she ever expected others to match her level of ambition. From that moment, Alia resolved to harden her heart, vowing to be self-reliant. Fast forward to years later, she transferred to a prestigious Japanese school and encountered Misachika, who, to her dismay, appeared to be yet another slacker who couldn't be bothered with the simplest tasks. When the school festival approached, everyone was given responsibilities, and unsurprisingly, Alia shouldered her burden alone. Other students tried to convince her to relax. It was just a festival, after all, but Alia's resolve was unwavering. She worked herself to the bone until Misachika suddenly intervened, urging her to go home and rest. To her astonishment, he had even arranged for the Handicrafts Club to assist in her absence, demonstrating that even a slacker like him could rally others to help if necessary. Misachika explained his methods to Alia, telling her that there was no point in handling everything alone. This, however, ticked Alia off, as she couldn't understand why he found it so wrong to take the festival seriously. She launched into one of her eye-rolling speeches about not compromising on quality, insisting that there was nothing wrong with working hard, especially since no one else seemed to care as much as she did. Misachika calmly reminded her that the whole point of festival attractions was to work together. Instead of doing everything herself, he suggested she use a bit of emotional blackmail to guilt-trip the others into working hard alongside her. But when he noticed she was gearing up for another lecture, he quickly apologized and expressed his appreciation for all her efforts. Reluctantly, Alia agreed to head home, but she couldn't help but wonder, what exactly was Misachika's deal? The next day, to her surprise, Misachika's plan worked, and the other students put in real effort. The festival ended up being a resounding success, and for the first time in a long while, Alia felt like she was part of something bigger than herself. She even sought out Misachika during the after-party, curious about his seemingly out-of-character behavior. They bantered about her dancing abilities, and for the first time, Alia found herself laughing at his jokes rather than getting frustrated. As the night went on, a group of Misachika's admirers attempted to corner Alia for a dance, but Misachika grabbed her hand and whisked her away, declaring that she was already taken. Alia's heart pounded as she was caught off guard by the gesture, and in that moment, something shifted. She was no longer just tolerating Misachika, she was beginning to genuinely enjoy his company. From then on, Alia's interactions with Misachika grew more frequent, and while she continued to needle him with her sharp tongue, deep down, her feelings were evolving. Returning to the present, Maria listens intently to the story, her eyes practically twinkling with the classic friends-to-lovers energy she recognizes from her own past experiences. Alia rolls her eyes, insisting that Misachika is nothing more than a friend. Maria, however, isn't convinced and teases Alia, suggesting that her newfound attachment to Misachika isn't as platonic as she claims. Alia tries to deny it but admits that Misachika is reliable when it counts. Maria responds by enthusiastically gushing over their budding relationship, much to Alia's dismay. The next day, Misachika arrives at the student council to cover for Yuki. Maria is excited to meet him and introduces herself as Alia's older sister and the council secretary. Despite her initial professionalism, she playfully insists that Misachika drop the formalities since he's practically family, 
thanks to his friendship with Alia. As they exchange pleasantries, Maria suddenly experiences a moment of recognition when she hears his first name. She freezes, realizing something but chooses to keep it to herself, apologizing for her sudden pause before continuing the conversation. Later, as Maria and Masachika shop for office supplies, Maria gets distracted by a cute plushie. She suggests buying one for each council member, but Masachika quickly shoots the idea down, humorously pointing out that giving out plushies will cement Kanzaki's status as a lifelong virgin. They compromise on not buying the plushies for the council but decide to grab one for Maria herself. As they walk back, Masachika observes Maria's quirky nature and wonders how Alia manages to deal with such an energetic sister. Their banter continues, with Maria naming the plush after Alia, claiming it symbolizes their bond. At their next stop, Maria gets busy talking to the tea shop owner while Masachika zones out, lost in thought. His mind drifts back to memories of his parents' divorce and the emotional aftermath of choosing to live with his father while Yuki stayed with their mother. Just as he starts to sink deeper into his thoughts, Maria notices his distant expression and brings him back to the present, giving him a comforting hug and patting his hair. The gesture feels strangely familiar to Misachika, momentarily soothing him, until Maria accidentally burns him with hot tea, effectively ruining the moment. Despite the chaos, Misachika can't help but appreciate the strange but supportive bond he's forming with Alia's family. Later on, Misachika and Maria return to the student council room, arms full of the supplies they'd purchased. As soon as they step inside, Kenzaki jokingly warns Maria not to leave her creepy demon plushie behind. The two of them hand over the items to Kenzaki, who glances through the supplies and thanks Misachika for preventing Maria from turning the council office into something straight out of Five Nights at Freddy's. Shifting to a more serious topic, Kenzaki asks if Misachika has considered officially joining the student council, but Misachika brushes it off, saying he'd rather watch paint dry. Still, he admits he doesn't mind helping out occasionally. Maria chimes in with a suggestion. Misachika could just join on paper, which makes him question why they're so eager to have him on board in the first place. Sensing his resistance, Kenzaki decides to dig a little deeper, asking Misachika why he'd prefer drinking sewer water over joining, hinting that perhaps there's more to his reluctance. He even recalls how Misachika had been a star back when he was vice president in middle school. Misachika, however, dismisses the compliment, saying that those days are long gone and he no longer has ambitions worthy of such a role. Kenzaki, always the instigator, reveals a surprising personal detail. He confesses that he only became the student council president to impress someone way out of his league. Misachika raises an eyebrow in surprise, so Kenzaki pulls out a picture of his former self, a rather hefty version that Misachika barely recognizes. The shocking transformation leaves Misachika gaping, and he blurts out that Kenzaki looks like he devoured his twin. Kenzaki admits that he was a lazy bum back then, but everything changed when he fell for someone far beyond his reach. That's when Misachika realizes Kenzaki managed to woo Chisaki, an impressive feat considering his former appearance. Kenzaki even adds that Maria joined the council only because Chisaki asked her to, with Maria playfully pleading guilty to the charge. With the mood lightened, Kenzaki steers the conversation back to Misachika, reminiscing about how well he and Yuki worked together in middle school. He assures Misachika that he has nothing to be ashamed of, nudging him toward reconsidering the student council. At this, Misachika recalls the good old days with his sister, and Kenzaki, spotting the nostalgia on his face, suggests it wouldn't be so bad if he joined the council again, just for the sake of making someone else president. Misachika agrees to think about it, and Kenzaki and Maria move on to other topics while Misachika ponders his next steps. He soon asks where Alia is, and Kenzaki informs him that she's off settling a dispute between the baseball and soccer teams. Apparently, both teams are fighting over the school field for practice space. The soccer team has regionals coming up, while the baseball team is being scouted by professionals. Ordinarily, Chisaki would handle disputes like this, but with her unofficially away on convenient duties, the task fell to Alia, who seems to be struggling with the situation. Hearing this, Misachika decides to head over and check things out. Sure enough, he arrives to find the baseball and soccer teams locked in a heated standoff, with Alia stuck in the middle trying to mediate. As tensions rise, the soccer team sarcastically asks her what brilliant solution she has to offer. Alia, thinking quickly, suggests they use the Riverside Park for practice. However, the soccer team passes the suggestion to the baseball team, who flatly refuse. Throughout the argument, both team captains remain suspiciously silent, and Alia begins to realize that her authoritative approach isn't working. Years of being distant and dismissive toward others have left her without the influence needed to sway them now. Feeling helpless, she quietly starts to cry, muttering in Russian for assistance. Just then, Masachika steps in, announcing that he's now in charge of general affairs for the student council and there to help. A few moments earlier, he had been nearby, 
observing the situation from a distance. He knew Alia's direct method was bound to fail but figured it would be a good learning experience for her, until he heard her soft plea for help in Russian. Unable to resist, he swooped in to save the day. The teams immediately recognize him from his middle school days, and Masachka quickly proposes a compromise. The baseball team would practice at the Riverside, given their smaller numbers, but in return, the soccer team would send some of their members to assist with the setup. The boys begin to object, but Masachika shoots a glance at the soccer team's management. The head manager, who had been silent up until now, suddenly steps forward and offers her team's help. The baseball players, sensing an opportunity, immediately agree, hoping for a grand slam in more ways than one. With the dispute finally settled, Masachika instructs the teams to file official practice requests the next day, while Alia stands there in awe, looking like a surprised Pikachu. As they head back to the office, Masachika apologizes for intervening and unintentionally making Alia look bad. Alia, to his surprise, lets it go but presses him on how he knew the soccer manager would step in. Masachika, impressed by her observation, explains that the manager is actually dating the baseball team captain. Of course, Alia hadn't noticed this. She was too busy monologuing to pick up on the subtle cues. The baseball captain had been silent because he was torn between helping his girlfriend and keeping his priorities in check. Masachika knew that the manager would jump at the chance to resolve the conflict for everyone's benefit. Kanzaki catches up with them and asks how it all went. Alia praises Masachika for working his magic, and Kenzaki commends them both. However, Masachika isn't fooled and calls out Kenzaki for setting the entire situation up. Kenzaki, grinning, admits to his scheming and slyly asks if Masachika has made up his mind about joining the council. With a sigh, Masachika finally agrees, resigning himself to stepping on metaphorical Legos just to join. Kenzaki gleefully invites him to the office to get started on the paperwork. Later, as Alia and Masachika head home together, Masachika laments getting played by yet another anime glasses guy. Alia then asks if he's really joining the council just to run alongside Yuki for the presidency. Masachika turns the question around, asking if she would back down from the presidential race if he were to run. Alia's determination flares up as she insists she would never back down, even if it meant going up against him directly. Expecting that response, Masachika makes a surprising offer. He'll help her become student council president. Alia is taken aback, but Masachika assures her that if that's what she wants, he'll support her every step of the way. Stretching out his hand, he offers his partnership. Wiping away her tears, Alia takes his hand, and they officially form a team. However, Alia says something in Russian that sparks a sense of familiarity in Masachika. The nostalgic feeling brings a smile to his face, until he realizes that Alia is cutting off the circulation in his hand. Playfully, Alia asks if he was thinking about someone else, and Masachika realizes he stepped into dangerous territory. She presses him, accusing him of thinking about Yuki after promising to be there for her, and even though Masachika denies it, Alia swiftly delivers a palm print to his cheek as punishment. Afterward, she extends her hand to help the idiot back on his feet. On the way home, Masachika jokes that his stats have increased thanks to her slap, but Alia fires back with a roast about his barely functioning brain. When they arrive at Alia's building, she asks if he's lost feeling in his cheek yet, but Masachika assures her he's fine. Then, without warning, Alia moves closer and plants a quick kiss on his cheek, leaving him completely shocked. Alia teases him for being surprised, while Masachika tries to decipher whether the kiss was intentional or just an accidental brush of cheeks. Alia walks away without providing any answers, leaving Masachika wishing he understood what she had said earlier in Russian. Unbeknownst to him, Alia had actually confessed her love to Masachika in Russian, and now she's having a mini meltdown over it. Even though she refuses to admit her feelings openly, she wonders if he'd just laugh in her face if he ever found out. Still wrestling with her emotions, Alia hears the front door open and sees Maria sitting nearby, looking troubled. When Alia asks what's bothering her, Maria pulls out the plushie and uses it to distract her, dodging the question entirely. As Maria walks away, she casually mentions meeting Masachika earlier and now understanding why Alia might have fallen for him. Alia vehemently denies the accusation yet again, but Maria advises her to confess her feelings quickly before someone else swoops in and steals him away. Meanwhile, Masachika is cringing as he reflects on the corny romance he witnessed earlier. He starts questioning the authenticity of Alia's love confession, but after a moment of overthinking, he convinces himself that it must be a figment of his imagination. His mind then drifts back to his childhood, remembering the frequent roast battles his parents had. This leads him to conclude that love, much like Sakura in Team 7, seems pretty useless. When Masachika arrives home, he notices Yuki's shoes by the door and suspects she might have set him up to join the student council. Reluctantly, he steps inside and finds Yuki in her fruit guard getup, making a rather extravagant display. 
Surprisingly, Masachika remains unfazed and accuses her of orchestrating this situation on purpose. Yuki admits to it but explains that she simply wanted to break the cliché of him walking in on her. Masachika is baffled by how clueless Yuki seems, but she attributes it to an overload of plot-induced brain rot. Yuki borrows some of Masachika's brain cells to acknowledge that her grand gesture was an apology for tricking him into joining the council. However, Mika, overhearing this conversation, praises Yuki's bravery in thinking her grand package was enough. Yuki insists she saw Masachika checking her out, but Masachika reveals that guys typically prefer subtle glances rather than full views. Yuki accepts this with grace but insists that Masachika looked her up and down. After some back and forth, Masachika admits he did check out her top half. Later, Yuki is in Masachika's room drying her hair and inquiring whether Kenzaki managed to recruit him to the council. Masachika confirms it and also mentions he'll be running for president with Alia. Yuki is stunned that Alia would pull such a move and laments the cosmic injustice of her smaller chest size compared to Alia's. Yuki insists that her own small but mighty package should be enough and offers Masachika a feel. When he refuses, Yuki brings up an old memory from elementary school where Masachika allegedly took the first squeeze of her chest. Masachika, struggling to recall the incident, finds it hard to believe, but Yuki narrates a game of tag from their childhood that turned into a game of grabs. Despite her detailed recounting, Masachika remains unconvinced, claiming he would have remembered such an event if it had happened. Yuki, finally letting it go, reminds Masachika of her asthma back then which made her less capable of playing. Now, she's recovered and hands him a brush as a token of apology for the old grievances. As Masachika brushes her hair, he apologizes for choosing Alia over her. Yuki reassures him that a bit of sibling rivalry would add to the drama and invites him to come back to her if the pressure of Alia's burden gets too much. Masachika, in turn, says there's no better way to go. Yuki leaves, glad that Masachika has found a new source of motivation, though she warns him that she'll still crush him like a nut if necessary. The next morning, Masachika is puzzled by Yuki's lack of any heinous wake-up pranks, assuming she must still be upset about the previous day's revelations. Determined to make amends, he gets up only to be startled by a hand grabbing him, which causes him to lose his chocolate cream in fright. Yuki laughs at his panicked expression but soon realizes she's stuck due to her own large posterior. Seizing the moment, Masachika takes revenge by stuffing his face with more cream, leading Yuki to lament getting her face stuffed with unborn nephews and nieces. Later, at school, Alia nervously awaits Masachika's arrival, trying to calm herself by thinking he might just be sleepwalking as usual. To her surprise, Masachika struts in looking bright-eyed and full of energy. As he interacts with classmates, Alia, viewing him through her love-struck filter, imagines him looking like Desai from Bungu Stray Dogs, which she finds somewhat attractive. She quickly tries to shake off her feelings and focuses on class. During gym class, Alia impresses with an excellent serve, while Masachika gets a ball to the head. Afterward, Masachika is nursing his head injury when Alia arrives to check on him. She offers to take him to the nurse's office, but he reassures her that getting hit in the face by a ball isn't new for him. Alia decides to play nurse, and as she examines him closely, Masachika struggles to maintain composure. When Alia fiddles with her hair, she gives him a close view that nearly distracts him, confirming his theory about peeking. Alia suggests they get some water, and as they head to the tap, Masachika becomes distracted by how much pressure Alia's throat can handle. Determined to wash away his inappropriate thoughts, he focuses on keeping his eyes on something else. Maria spots them and approaches, wondering why Masachika keeps looking up. Turns out he's thanking his luck for the gym uniforms. Maria notices he's wet and uses her towel to dry him off, which gives Masachika a brief but undeniable private view. He thanks her for the rubdown and jokingly comments that he now understands how dogs must feel. Maria flirts with him, saying dogs have the best style, but Alia interrupts, suggesting they head back. As they leave, Masachika prepares for Alia's reprimand, but to his surprise, she's still concerned about his injury and hasn't caught on to his wandering thoughts. Alia, now red-faced with realization that Masachika wasn't paying attention due to hunger rather than boredom, is further flustered. Masachika tries to make light of the situation with jokes, but Alia, irritated by his lack of seriousness and her own overthinking, storms off, regretting her concern for the clueless idiot who she insists she does not have feelings for. After her last class, Masachika asks Alia if she wants to go to the student council office together. She looks at him with a mix of annoyance and disbelief but silently walks away. Masachika wonders if he crossed a line, but then notices a group of well-trained simps exiting the office. Peeking inside, he finds a Masachika lookalike ready to take on the role of head chopper. Panicked, he tries to leave but is pulled back and apologizes for being mistaken for someone involved with the baseball and soccer teams. Apparently, 
Chisaki had taught the boys a lesson for ignoring Alia, though she assures Misachika she was gentle with her sword. Chisaki then calls Kenzaki her defense, and he reassures Misachika that Chisaki won't get rough with others, except him. Chisaki emphasizes this by giving Kenzaki a playful smack, which he takes in stride. Maria walks in and warns them not to get carried away, leading to Chisaki apologizing to Kenzaki for overdoing it. They exchange affectionate glances, and Alia and Misachika start gossiping about whether Chisaki has a secret torture chamber. Maria, noticing their chattiness, teases them about their cuteness. Yuki arrives, apologizing for her lateness, and Kenzaki starts the meeting by asking Misachika to introduce himself. Misachika takes the floor, states his position, and announces that he and Alia will be running mates in the upcoming election. Misachika then explains that his entire persona is modeled after a niece skull subscriber and takes a seat. Kenzaki commends him and assigns him to work with Maria for the day to get accustomed to things. Yuki interrupts, saying she needs to discuss the budget with the arts club, and since Alia is the treasurer, she'll need to accompany her. Alia agrees, and the girls head out together, but Misachika senses a storm brewing. On their way, Alia asks Yuki if they can talk privately, leading them to an empty classroom. There, Alia reveals her plan to run for office with Misachika, only to learn from Yuki that he's already beaten her to it. While Alia is relieved to clear that up, Yuki starts airing her grievances about losing Misachika. When Alia inquires further, Yuki declares that she loves Misachika more than she loves her own parents. Alia is stunned by this revelation. When Yuki presses Alia on her feelings for Misachika, Alia insists she considers him only as a friend. Yuki pushes her to admit her true feelings, cornering Alia until she finally declares that she won't let Yuki have him because Misachika is hers. Yuki is pleased with this answer and says they should head to the arts club now. They agree to use their code names for the upcoming battle, and Yuki walks ahead while Alia stays behind to process the impact of her own claim on Misachika. Meanwhile, Misachika is working with Maria and is surprised by her efficiency, especially in contrast to Chisaki, who is fidgeting as if she's holding in pee. Kenzaki dismisses her and apologizes for the disturbance, but Misachika suspects her skills are mostly in torture tactics. Maria suggests they take a break and offers tea, mentioning her expertise with it. When Misachika sees the jam on the table, he asks if it's a Russian tradition, and Maria confirms. He then inquires if black tea is only a winter staple, but Maria explains it's a year-round thing because her mother was a tea enthusiast. Misachika admits his knowledge of Russia is limited to movie references, despite studying the language due to a crush. As he sips the tea, he recalls that his estranged mother is also a tea lover but gets distracted when Maria adds more jam. He tries it but finds it an acquired taste. Just then, Yuki and Alia return, and there's an odd tension between them. Alia quickly sits close to Misachika, claiming it's Russian bad luck for a girl to sit at the corner of the table. When Misachika notices Yuki's intense stare, he realizes something must have happened between them. Maria confirms the Russian superstition but clarifies it's more for those seeking marriage. Alia brushes it off and responds in Russian that she hasn't found her groom yet. Misachika is relieved but puzzled by what it means. Maria hands Alia a mountain of jam, making Misachika curious about her capacity. As the day winds down, Kenzaki dismisses the first years. On the way home, Misachika suggests stopping by a family diner to discuss the upcoming elections. Alia laments that it's not a date, which makes Misachika cringe at the thought of Russian customs. At the diner, Alia orders a large amount of dessert to feel better, and Misachika asks if anything happened with Yuki. Alia inquires if he and Yuki are dating, but he vehemently denies it, saying he'd rather face a colossal titan. When Alia wonders what's going on, Misachika explains that Yuki just enjoys messing with people and shifts the conversation to more pressing matters. He reveals that their chances of winning against Yuki are slim. At the start of middle school, there were six pairs of candidates, including himself and Yuki, but half dropped out after a student congress debate that skewed the favor toward one side. Alia asks why so many dropped out, and Misachika explains that it was essentially a preview of the elections, which made the outcome seem predetermined. Alia is frustrated by the odds and accidentally breaks her straw as she drowns her sorrows in dessert. She switches to eating more dessert, prompting Misachika to wonder if it's really that good. Alia decides to tease him by offering him a taste of her dessert. Despite his initial reluctance, Misachika accepts and takes a mouthful, which draws attention from the rest of the diner. Misachika notices a familiar figure outside but is interrupted by Alia asking how they can compete with Yuki. He suggests they approach the election from a different angle to appeal to students, using Kenzaki's surprising win as an example. Even though Kenzaki wasn't on the council and faced a formidable rival, his success was unexpected and impressive, leading to widespread support. 
Alia wonders if she needs a compelling backstory to showcase her hard work, but Masachika is too preoccupied with the dessert incident. Deciding to order a meal and a fresh spoon to avoid further awkwardness, Masachika is teased by Alia for being flustered over something minor. He asks if swapping DNA is a common practice in Russia, and Alia, in Russian, tells him he's the only one she'd do it with, making Masachika nervous. They return to discussing the election, and Masachika says their first chance to gain support will be at the end of the first term when the council delivers its policy speech. Alia asks what she should include in her speech, and Masachika advises her to speak from the heart, acknowledging her charm. Alia blushes and wishes for more praise. When she asks about the food, Masachika offers her some, but he remembers she can't handle spicy food. Alia, stubborn as ever, agrees to try a chili pepper despite its heat. After she swallows it and mourns her taste buds, the pair walks home. Alia asks what Yuki might do now that she's lost her running mate, and Masachika speculates that Yuki, being highly popular, might select someone from their old student council. However, if she teams up with Tanima, her former opponent from middle school whose campaign ended bitterly, it could create problems. Masachika concludes they'll find out soon enough. The next day, Yuki introduces a new council member, and Masachika nearly chokes when Ayan walks in as a new member of the student council, joining general affairs with Masachika. After leaving the room, Masachika hears a faint sound calling him master. Just as he's about to pull out some holy water from his pocket, he notices Ayano standing behind him. She requests that he follow her, and Masachika decides to comply. They head into a quieter area, where Ayano asks Masachika if the rumors about him running for president with Alia are true. When Masachika confirms this, Ayano reveals that the head of the family, i.e. his grandfather, is extremely displeased. He doesn't want Masachika to stand in Yuki's path to greatness. Masachika clenches his teeth in anger as he recalls how his grandfather told him he was no longer a suitable heir when he left home, and how it was his grandfather's brilliant idea to keep his relationship with Yuki a secret. Sighing at his paternal issues, Masachika asks Ayano if she's here to probe his true intentions on someone else's orders. Ayano explains that, since she is Yuki's retainer, it is her job to find out what the opposing party wants. Realizing that Ayano is as clueless as a doormat, Masachika assures her that he has no intention of going up against Yuki. He is simply trying to advance the plot with Alia. Despite this, Ayano, being as dense as a brick, misunderstands and asks if Masachika is deliberately hurting Yuki to protect Alia's dream because he's smitten with the Russian girl. Masachika curtly tells Ayano that he is helping Alia because that's what he wants to do, and instructs her to relay this information to her so-called grandfather. Ayano agrees, but before leaving, she asks Masachika how he truly feels about Yuki. Masachika responds that Yuki means the world to him, and that hasn't changed. Later, Masachika is hanging out with his friends when Takeshi and Neru excitedly show him a magazine featuring women and ask him to pick one for a freaky time. At first, Masachika tries to explain that he's not into that sort of thing, but not wanting to seem impotent in front of his friends, he picks a brown-haired girl. The boys then point out that the girl he chose looks remarkably like Maria. When they press Masachika about whether he'd think about Maria in a more intimate context, Masachika reminds them that Maria has a boyfriend. Suddenly, Masachika feels like someone is shooting daggers at him. Turning around, he finds Alia staring at him. Masachika quickly clarifies that the magazine belongs to Takeshi. As Alia takes her seat, the boys continue to probe Masachika about his type in women. Eventually, Masachika admits that he wants to date someone he can be friends with. Hearing this, Alia whispers in Russian that she would be the perfect fit, making Masachika blush. However, he then remembers a girl from his childhood and reveals that he wants a girl with a bright smile. His friends, not understanding his preference, add that it's important for a girl to be approachable. Alia, who is as cold as a toilet seat in winter, becomes irritated by Masachika's preference and makes a big fuss. After berating Masachika for having such a type, Alia confiscates Takeshi's magazine. Meanwhile, Yuki asks Ayano if she is satisfied with her investigation. Ayano replies that her faith in Masachika has been restored and informs Yuki of everything Masachika said during their conversation. When Yuki asks Ayano how serious her brother was, Ayano reveals that Masachika was so serious that her uterus began to tremble. Yuki is taken aback and admits to Ayano that she was about to go off on Masachika but is relieved this is a child-friendly show. To further calm Yuki, Ayano shares that everyone believes Yuki will win the election, as many think Alia is being reckless by challenging her. Yuki is delighted by this and tells Ayano that she has been waiting for a showdown with Masachika, who is also intelligent like her, and now she finally has the chance to prove who is the better sibling. Yuki then turns to Ayano and asks if she looks scarier than a baddie without makeup. 
Later that day, the student council gathers for a meeting where Yuki, Maria, and Ayano play a bluffing game. Masachika, Kenzaki, and Chisaki watch from afar. The boys discuss how Alia, despite seeming cold, actually wears her heart on her sleeve, while Maria is harder to read. Chisaki adds that Maria even looks like she might have a few screws loose, prompting Misachika to side with her. Their conversation is interrupted when Ayano, observing diligently, is asked by Kenzaki if she learned to be disobedient due to her duties as Yuki's retainer. Ayano reveals that she learned everything from her grandparents, who used to work for Yuki's family. When Chisaki and Kenzaki inquire about her parents, Ayano explains that they are office workers, and she became a retainer because she admires her grandparents and has a humiliation kink. During the discussion, Ayano admits that she trained her whole childhood to become the best doormat anyone has seen. Suddenly, Maria joins them and reveals that Alia scolded her for being annoying. Concerned about Alia's well-being, Kenzaki and Shisaki are reassured by Misachika and Maria that Alia is actually enjoying the competition with Yuki, which is quite rare. Wanting to get some refreshments, Maria asks Misachika to accompany her to the convenience store. After collecting everyone's orders, the two head to the store. Maria thanks Misachika for supporting Alia's presidential quest, noting that with his support, Alia now has someone to rely on. Misachika shrugs off the praise, but Maria emphasizes that it's a big deal because Alia is very competitive. Misachika then asks Maria if she purposely hides her competitive side from Alia. Maria admits that her sister is very serious and tries her best at everything, so she doesn't want to add another battle to Alia's list of challenges. As they approach the vending machine, Maria explains that she is going the extra mile for Alia because sibling relationships are very complicated. This prompts Misachika to think about his own sister and wonder if Yuki is intentionally playing dumb around him. However, he quickly dismisses this thought, realizing Yuki is just not very bright. Maria then accuses Misachika of doing the same, but Misachika explains that he acts like a jerk because he wants to live an easier life. As a result, Maria pats his head and commends him for doing the bare minimum. The next day, Alia is approached by Tanima, who sternly questions her about whether she manipulated Misachika into partnering with her. Taken aback by the accusation, Alia remains silent until Misachika arrives and asks Tanima to apologize for her indecent words. Instead, Tanima calls for a general meeting, determined to expel Misachika from the student council committee. The following morning, Misachika and Alia set out to meet with the council president to discuss their unusual encounter with Tan. As they recount their experience, the president appears visibly confused. He expresses surprise, mentioning that Taniyama is known as a well-respected and exceptionally smart student, which leads him to believe that defeating her in these debates will not be an easy feat Alia remains unfazed by this information, maintaining her composure. However, Misachika raises a valid point, noting that there is no tangible benefit for them in engaging with Tan, as she isn't even running for the presidency. Despite this, Alia insists that facing Taniyama still presents an important opportunity for her. She believes that by debating Tan, she can showcase her skills and ideology in front of the entire student body, which might help her gain additional support as the campaign progresses. Later in the day, Misachika and Alia meticulously review their debate strategy, fine-tuning their approach. Misachika puts Alia through a series of mock debates, listening intently to her responses as she counters potential accusations that Taniyama might throw at her. Misachika only stops once he is satisfied with Alia's preparation and confident in her ability to handle herself during the actual debate. As they prepare to leave, Alia suddenly asks Misachika a question that has been on her mind. Does Taniyama harbor any personal animosity toward him? Misachika pauses, gazing off into the distance as he reflects on their relationship. He eventually responds, saying that he believes both he and Taniyama respect each other equally and that there is no bad blood between them. In fact, Misachika reveals that Taniyama was once a close friend of his during their middle school years. This revelation catches Alia off guard, and she can't help but wonder why Taniyama would choose to oppose Misachika so aggressively now. Misachika explains that Taniyama likely perceives his actions as disruptive to the election process. From Tan's perspective, Misachika's decision to withdraw his support from Yuki, who is currently at the peak of her strength, in favor of a different candidate seems reckless. Taniyama probably believes that Misachika is simply stirring up trouble for the sake of creating chaos, which is something she finds frustrating and hard to accept. The following day, as Misachika and Alia make their way to the auditorium, they are approached by a girl named Mia, who belongs to Generation Z and is a known friend of Tan. Mia, appearing quite familiar with Misachika, greets them casually and suggests that they relax before walking ahead of them. Alia is immediately put off by Mia's confident demeanor, finding it difficult to warm up to her. Misachika, on the other hand, points out that Mia is incredibly popular among the students, 
which means that her opinions carry significant influence. This observation leads Alia to realize that a person with strong connections, like Mia, could potentially pose a threat to their campaign. Despite this, Misachika reassures Alia, telling her not to worry about Mia and instead focus on the debate, which is their immediate priority. As the students start to fill the auditorium, chatter spreads quickly throughout the room, with students from every class discussing the upcoming elections. The large crowd of students and the rising buzz of conversation begin to unnerve Alia. She starts to feel the weight of their judgments, believing that many of them might be questioning her worthiness for the position. These negative thoughts cause Alia to spiral into self-doubt, as she reflects on how she has never truly formed any meaningful connections with others at the school. Sensing her distress, Misachika steps in to calm her down. He reminds her that her true opponent in the debate isn't Tan, but rather the ideal version of herself that she aspires to become. He encourages her to relax, even suggesting that she Netflix and chill for a bit. Misachika assures her that if anything goes wrong, he will step in and handle it himself. His words manage to soothe Alia's nerves, and she gradually regains her composure as they prepare to take their positions for the debate. When the debate begins, Ken, the moderator, introduces both sides and invites the opposition to present their views. Taniyama is the first to take the podium, and instead of directly challenging Alia, she decides to target Misachika. Taniyama launches into a scathing critique of the student council, arguing that its members are handpicked solely by the president and vice president, which she believes opens the door to corruption, nepotism, and favoritism. She claims that some council members, who have never achieved anything noteworthy, receive special treatment despite their mediocre grades and lack of athletic ability. These individuals, according to Tan, are elevated to positions of power over other students who have worked tirelessly to succeed. Taniyama goes on to argue that the selection process for the student council should be based solely on academic performance and extracurricular achievements, with the decisions being made by teachers rather than students. Her speech resonates with the audience, earning her applause from the entire student body. As the applause dies down, Ken invites Alia to respond to Tan's arguments. Alia confidently steps up to the podium and begins to deliver her counterpoint. She starts by emphasizing that the school takes great pride in its tradition of student self-governance, which reflects the maturity and responsibility of the student body. Alia argues that if Taniyama believes the student council requires the intervention of teachers to make decisions as simple as choosing council members, then it suggests that Taniyama lacks the confidence and strength to manage these responsibilities on her own. Furthermore, Alia highlights that academic grades alone should not be the sole measure of a person's abilities. She points out that everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. A student who might be average in academics could possess remarkable social skills and problem-solving abilities, which are crucial qualities for a successful student council member. Misachika, observing from the sidelines, realizes that Alia has successfully defended her position. However, Taniyama isn't finished yet. She interrupts Alia with a barrage of questions, attempting to undermine her arguments. But one by one, Alia calmly and effectively addresses each of Tan's points, demonstrating her ability to stay composed under pressure. Misachika can't help but smile as he watches the scene unfold, noting that while Taniyama initially believed that he was her true rival in the debate, in reality, it was always Alia who posed the greater challenge. Taniyama begins to falter, struggling to maintain her momentum. She raises one final question, asking what would happen if the president or vice president were to lose control and go on a power trip. Before Alia can respond, several students in the audience start to cause a disturbance. They shout accusations at Alia, calling her an outsider and insisting that Taniyama is far more deserving of a place on the council. The unexpected outburst catches Alia off guard, shattering her concentration. She suddenly forgets the response she had prepared, and her confidence begins to crumble. Misachika quickly realizes that Mia is behind this disruption, having planted the students in the crowd to create chaos and throw Alia off balance. Unfortunately, Mia's plan works, and Alia is visibly shaken as Taniyama continues to press her for an answer. Just as Alia is on the verge of breaking down, she feels Misachika's reassuring hand on her back. Stepping in to save the day, Misachika takes the microphone and claims that Alia has lost her voice because she was busy deep-throating some hot dogs the previous night. His offbeat comment catches everyone off guard, and instead of continuing the debate in a traditional manner, Misachika switches gears and launches into an impromptu stand-up comedy routine. He begins roasting the student council president for no apparent reason, turning the serious atmosphere of the debate into something more lighthearted. Misachika humorously points out that if the decision of who gets to join the student council were left to the teachers, who would likely select only the top academic performers, 
Ken would have never become president. He goes on to describe how Ken had terrible grades and was considered a total loser during his first year. But thanks to the student council's focus on passion and talent, Ken was able to overcome his past shortcomings and become the beloved president he is today. With that, Misachika dramatically drops the microphone, and all eyes turn to Tan, waiting for her response. But instead of retaliating, Taniyama decides to avoid further humiliation and runs off the stage, with Alia quickly following behind her. Eventually, Alia catches up to Tan, only to find her in tears. It turns out that Taniyama had been secretly shipping Misachika with Yuki all along, and when Alia entered the picture, it felt like Misachika had abandoned Yuki without a second thought. This realization made Taniyama furious because she had always admired Yuki, especially after losing to her in the middle school presidential elections. To Tan, Misachika's choice to support Alia over Yuki felt like a betrayal, as it implied that Alia might actually be better than Yuki. Understanding Tan's frustration, Alia empathizes with her but suggests that she seek help from a psychologist to work through her feelings. Afterward, Alia returns to the auditorium, where she learns that the debate has officially concluded and that she has been declared the winner. Later, Alia shares with Misachika what Taniyama had revealed during their conversation. Misachika reflects on Tan's history and acknowledges that she was one of the fiercest competitors they had ever faced in middle school. However, Taniyama eventually accepted her defeat to Yuki and Misachika because she believed she could never surpass them. Alia listens to Misachika and, with determination in her voice, declares that she will work as hard as possible to become someone that Taniyama respects just as much as she respects Yuki. Alia hopes that by earning Tan's respect, she will also gain Tan's approval of her partnership with Misachika. Misachika smiles at Alia's determination but is caught off guard when she suddenly asks him a serious question. Why did he choose her over Yuki, especially when he and Yuki had such a strong partnership? The question brings a look of sadness to Misachika's face as memories flood back to him. He recalls the difficult circumstances that once forced him to be separated from his sister, Yuki. Wanting to make up for lost time, he had promised himself that he would always support her throughout her life, helping her achieve her goals. However, Misachika decides not to share these personal details with Alia. Instead, he tells her that he never truly wanted to be the vice president in the first place. In fact, he had always hated the spotlight, but he owed Yuki a favor, which is why he reluctantly accepted the role. Misachika goes on to explain that this time around, things are different. He genuinely wants to support and work alongside Alia because he believes in her potential to become an outstanding president. Hearing this makes Alia feel incredibly happy and reassured about her partnership with Misachika. Their conversation takes a reflective turn when Misachika, feeling curious, asks Alia why she chose to run in the presidential election with him, knowing how important it was. After all, she could have chosen someone more experienced or more well-connected to be her running mate. To his surprise, Alia responds to his question in Russian, a language Misachika doesn't understand. The mysterious reply leaves him momentarily speechless, and before he can ask for clarification, Alia gets up and starts walking away with a playful smile on her face. Misachika quickly follows after her, repeatedly asking what she had just said. But Alia, still smiling, teases him, saying that if he she really wants to know the really meaning wants of her words, delicious white he'll have cream. to learn Russian. Alia, still smiling, teases him, saying that if he really wants to know the meaning of her words, he'll have to learn Russian. For me, it's clear that Alia chose him We see Yuki having dinner with the man from the other day, saying that he heard that on the day Misachika participated in the student council, the heir to the Taniyama Industries, Yuki, mentioned that since she competed against Yuki in the student council elections in high school, she expected good things from her. However, it seems that she retired in the middle of the debate. Although Yuki considers that he must have his good reasons, the man says that whatever the reasons, he made Misachika's campaign gain legitimacy. Though it doesn't matter who he faces, he cannot lose to Yuki. Yuki, in turn, told his grandfather that this is what he did. The grandfather tells him that he may not have as much aptitude as Misachika, but he knows that a great Don has great responsibilities, responsibilities from which Misachika fled. He was born with an unparalleled talent and privilege, but he got rid of everything so losing is not an option for him, something that is clear to Yuki. His mother then interrupts him to ask if she and Misachika are still getting along. Yuki says yes. His mother asks if she knows anything about him, and Yuki replies that it doesn't matter, wishing good luck in Yuki's Chinese classes. Later, in her room, she asks Yano to let her hug him, giving him a hug and rubbing her face on his chest, which makes her feel much better, 
as there is nothing better than a good pair of breasts, right? In class, the boys are eager to blame him for what he did in the debate because they think that Tanyama won because of his argument, but that wasn't the case. He greets Alia and notices that she is still cold, like him. He tells her that the boys want to know about her feet last week. Misachika gave her a nudge to interest her classmates and ask things like whether she wrote her speech alone, and she told them all the strategies she had, though without expecting Misachika's help. The boys couldn't believe that Tanyama left in the middle of the debate and that it was pathetic, something that Alia seems not to like much, and she leaves the place. She goes to find her and asks if it bothers her that they are mocking Tanyama. Misachika tells her that they did nothing wrong, just fought fairly, and there is no need to tell others that it's wrong to talk about her like that. He doesn't tell her that they didn't defeat them but that they simply left like that. Misachika replies that what really matters is what she wants to do. Alia wants to help Tanyama so for Misachika it's fine and they will do it. Alia feels that this will only give Misachika more work but Misachika only wants to help her, which surprises Alia. Although Misachika noticed a movement and we see that Kenzaki Chisaki is under the table, apologizing, thinking that this is worthy of a romantic comedy but he should pretend he didn't notice. He walks towards Alia, and she now thinks that here too there is a romantic comedy scene going wrong in many ways. So the only thing they can do is divert their attention and finally tell Kenzaki and Shisaki how long they plan to stay hidden. Kenzaki appears and apologizes for not having managed to get out in time, while Alia is nervous, unable to say anything but pretending nothing happened. They leave the place, and Alia gets super nervous and runs off to another place. We see Nanoa with her classmates talking about fashion with Misachika at the entrance of the room, wondering if she really has to approach them and her friends, convincing Nanoa to go to a party. She notices Misachika's presence and asks if he needs anything, but he needs to speak to her privately. They go to another place, and Nanoa asks if he wants to invite her out, although she presumes that's not why. She asks him if maybe he doesn't like her. Regardless of his declaration, she doesn't tell him that she's now alone and wouldn't mind if it was him. She just tells him that she should go out with someone she likes, but she has never done that, which is very serious to him. Well, Nanoa can't do anything about it because she doesn't understand relationships or love, because he tells him not to interfere. But he says he shouldn't underestimate himself so much, something Taniyama hadn't told him anymore. Nanoa says she's here because she wants to stop people from talking badly about Taniyama, because it bothers Alia. Nanoa says she's a very kind girl, though she asks why he's telling her if she's his enemy, that she's a very mysterious person, she is so interested in her. Nanoa replies what it is, that's why he wants to have her around because she intrigues him, and since both are cynical attached to optimistic classmates. So the plan is simple, they will spread a rumor giving a valid explanation for Tan Yama's departure. He doesn't ask if it is. Be sure, as his victory will be in doubt. Although this doesn't matter to them, it's agreed. Nanoa says no while he accuses her. This reminds her of a manga where she calls a spy and she appears, just to joke. She appears out of nowhere with Yuki, and they are here because they saw that they approached the enemy. Nanoa then hid under the table to hear everything because they are crazy. Alia arrives and sees them together with a suspicious look because she tries to apologize for what Alia said to her. He says if it's bad that three childhood friends meet and he leaves saying in Russian how much they left him aside, while we see Nanoa walking and remembering how Tanyama saw her kissing a boy, seeing how Tanyama then kissed him. Slaps for inflaming the prayer and then comments in her class that Tanyama left the debate because he was angry with her and not because she escaped to another place. We see Misachika explaining to Alia that he only met Yuki and Yano by chance, something Alia doesn't know. She seems to believe a lot. Later, we see them studying and Misachika telling Alia if he's not too close. Alia asks if this bothers him because he doesn't say it since he doesn't see them. That's when Yuki comes to interrupt to study with them and others, saying in Russian that he would prefer to be alone. Later, Alia asks Misachika why Yuki is only reading the solutions to Yano. They say he has always been like this because he prefers to memorize the solutions instead of practicing, which bothers Alia a little. Misachika asks Yano if she has any doubts, but she says no, prefers him to tell her that she is a waste of air than to help her, although Misachika doesn't plan to do that. She asks if they are really childhood friends because they seem very close even being childhood friends. Maria arrives and gathers everyone to give them her fantastic tea, and Maria sees a book about hypnosis for mannequins that was confiscated and then asks Alia to try it with her, but Alia says she won't do it. So Maria asks Misachika to do it for her. Misachika says yes, and Yuki something occurs to him, 
Then Masachika asks Maria to focus her eyes on his finger. He will notice that her mind slowly enters a trance and to keep her gaze fixed there, he becomes very sleepy. Deep sleep. This is how Masachika gives the applause and she falls asleep there. She doesn't believe him and when it seems she has fallen asleep, Masachika will undo the hypnosis, saying that when he touches her shoulder, she will wake up so he can touch her and she wakes up. Maria asks why she stopped when he said he was going to give the applause when she didn't remember what happened, something Alia doesn't believe. Yuki now asks Alia to let herself be hypnotized just so they know if Maria is telling the truth or not, so they start with that and indeed the pseudonym falls asleep and Maria too, with Yuki saying this is a perfect opportunity to fondle the breasts to execute his plan of making them undress through hypnosis, which he thinks is crazy to have thought of all this. So Yuki tells them that now they will feel more and more uninhibited, freed from the shackles of common sense, and an undresses body and mind. They wake up to approach Misachika and see how Maria is affectionately touching Misachika and Alia. Alia wakes up and begins to remove her clothes, and Maria, in turn, also begins to do the same. This surprises them, and Misachika says that when he touches their shoulders, they will wake up. But this doesn't seem to be working with any of them apparently. Only then does Chisaki arrive, not knowing what is happening here. Yuki comments to everyone that this is happening because of the hypnosis book. Then, Shizaki does something with his hands and they fall. Ed asks what he did, and Shizaki comments that what he did was restart the lamps, as they are desperate, not knowing what happened and why they are not dressed. Shizaki asks if he saw and if he also wants him to restart him. After all the chaos involving hypnosis, a Russian-Japanese girl, and death threats, all Misachika Q's wanted was a bit of peace at home to study quietly. However, he couldn't keep his mind on his work because Brain Hazard, the hottest anime of the moment, was about to release its latest episode. Hughes struggled to focus on studying instead of the anime, but it just wasn't happening. When he glanced at the clock, he realized the episode had already been released and found himself stuck in that classic mental conflict between leisure and responsibility. Amid this, Alia called him, even though she didn't have a specific reason for it. Playfully, he asked if she missed hearing his voice, and Alia replied in Russian, questioning if there was anything wrong with that. When Qs heard this, he could only imagine himself collapsing. He remembered telling her that he tended to get silly when alone, so she asked if he was managing to study. Qs admitted he was having trouble concentrating and wanted to know how Alia managed to stay focused in such moments. To motivate him, Alia suggested a bet. Since their exams were starting the next day, if Qs placed among the top 30 students in the school, she would do anything he asked. If he didn't, he'd have to make a request without much thought. Hughes thought it was a good deal either way but quickly realized his mistake and warned her that he wasn't interested in any masochistic demands or anything like that. Alia dismissed his concern and mentioned a name in Russian, claiming she had given him a hint. Hughes pretended not to understand, and they sealed the deal. Interestingly, Alia didn't seem too upset by his outburst, which had been happening more frequently lately. Hughes noted that she was starting to get under her older brother's skin, and Alia quickly reminded him that they were the same age. Hughes observed that her birthday was November 7th, while his was April 9th, making him older. After this observation, Hughes noticed that Alia's enthusiasm in the conversation had waned, so he awkwardly said goodbye. As he hung up, he reflected on how Alia seemed to have figured out he was losing focus and wondered if they were developing a mental connection. In reality, Alia had called because she was scared after watching a horror movie but couldn't admit it to him. What bothered her most was discovering that Q's birthday had already passed and he hadn't mentioned it, which hurt her feelings as she couldn't understand how her best friend could do that. Five days later, Q's complimented Alia on her exam performance, but she responded with a hint of coldness. To lighten the mood, Q's quickly invited her to discuss the graduation ceremony on their way home. As they walked, Q's found it odd that Alia hadn't flirted with him in Russian since their phone call. Curious, he asked why she had been acting differently since the start of exam season, and Alia admitted she hadn't hidden it well. Hughes noted that she had done a great job hiding her feelings, but he had still noticed. Seizing the moment, Alia asked if he cared enough to pay that much attention to her. Hughes assured her that he did because Alia was a precious partner. His words softened her mood, and her cheeks flushed red as she needed reassurance that she was important to him. Still, 
She wanted to know why he hadn't invited her to his birthday party, so she mustered the courage to ask. Hughes explained that he hadn't thrown a party, assuming that celebrating birthdays was a Russian tradition. After all, he hadn't had a birthday party since elementary school. Nevertheless, this was the perfect opportunity for him to ask if Alia really wanted to celebrate his birthday with him. She explained defensively that in Russia, not inviting someone to your birthday meant you no longer wanted that person in your life. Hughes wasn't entirely convinced by this explanation but invited Alia to celebrate his belated birthday anyway to prove he valued their friendship. The next day, they planned a belated celebration and met up in town. Hughes felt the heat but knew it was better to be dressed this way than in the long-sleeved uniform while Alia mentioned that the student council president was considering cooler uniforms for the school. Hughes looked around and noticed everyone was staring at them. When he glanced back at Alia, he saw that familiar aura of beauty around her, which made him understand why she attracted so much attention. He commented on it, and she explained that it was just the price of being beautiful. He imagined she would get hit on a lot if she were alone, and indeed she did, though Alia often responded in Russian until they gave up. Hughes was glad that Alia didn't let any smooth talkers string her along, to which she pointed out that his reaction showed a possessive streak, almost as if they were a couple. Hughes admitted that he tended to act that way when on a date, which embarrassed Alia, who realized she was indeed on a date with the boy she liked. She commented in Russian that it was her first time, and Hughes wasn't sure if she meant her first time with him or her first date ever. They soon arrived at Casa Duif, a restaurant that was usually pricey but offered great lunch deals. Once inside, Hughes gave a brief overview of how the graduation ceremony worked. First, the candidates for student council president would present their political goals, followed by their running mates explaining why they supported their candidate. Then came the most important part. Although the event didn't involve a formal vote, it was similar. After each pair spoke, the audience reacted and applauded only for whom they wanted to win. Alia asked if it was possible for a candidate to receive no applause at all, and Cuse explained that it was possible. He imagined they wouldn't be able to match Yuki's applause due to her popularity, so their goal was to keep the gap from being too large. Alia thought the strategy was too defensive, but Hughes considered it a realistic assessment of the current situation. Speaking of which, he planned for their team to give their speech before their competitor because the first speaker usually receives a more subdued reaction while the crowd weighs its options, giving them an excuse if Yuki outshines them. Alia didn't like the idea and shot Hughes a dirty look, so he tried to lighten the mood by asking if the clever girl would rather play dirty by messing with their opponent's heads. Alia softened a bit, and her partner eased the tension by assuring her that Yuki wouldn't stoop so low either since she wasn't like Mami Nua. Alia asked what he meant by that, but their food arrived just in time, and they turned their attention to celebrating the belated birthday. Soon, Alia wondered if her running mate had started the rumor about Mami, but Kyuz pretended it was all her initiative. Either way, it buried the issue with Taniyama but also buried the results of the Congress. Alia regretted that but thanked her friend for prioritizing her during the process. With that, Kyuz got flustered and turned away, and Alia, for the first time in Japanese, commented that the boy looked really cute when he was embarrassed, then offered him a piece of meat to feed him. Everyone around was tense, expecting a climax while Kyuz casually ate the meat and noticed the girl using the same fork afterward without a care. After the meal, Alia gave her friend a mug as a gift, and he joked that it looked like something couples buy, to which Alia confessed that he had read her mind because that's exactly what she had done. Her matching mug was already safely stored at home. Hearing this, Hughes almost lost his composure but tried to hold it together to avoid falling completely for the Russian girl. Back at school, while they waited for their turn in the meeting with the teachers and parents, Kenzaki wanted to discuss the proposal for summer uniforms with the student council members. Masha stood up to make some tea and asked Sayano to relax, as the girl also stood up just when someone started a task. The poor girl froze and Kanaki informed them that they should be able to implement the new uniforms after the summer break, so they planned to make a surprise announcement at the closing ceremony. Yuki supported the idea, saying no one should have to wear a blazer in this heat while the president gave all the credit for this achievement to his beloved Sarisha. She did the same, and the two entered their own little world of love in front of everyone. Amid this, Masha awkwardly served Hughes a cup of tea, and he deduced that she was still bothered by the hypnosis incident. Then Kenzaki's parents arrived, signaling it was time for his meeting. Masha mentioned she would wash the dishes, and Hughes offered to help. While doing so, he took the opportunity to apologize for the hypnosis, but she reminded him it had been her idea. In fact, 
She was curious about what she had done to him while hypnotized, so Q's told her that she had pulled him and Alia in and started stroking their heads. The girl was relieved it hadn't gone further, though she had heard Q's was watching while they were hypnotized. Despite the situation, Q's found Masha cuter than intimidating with her angry face, and as punishment, she pinched and tugged at his cheeks, teaching him not to mess around with a girl like her. Just then, Masha's mother called her to join the meeting, leaving Q's to finish the task. After washing the dishes, Q's returned to the student council room, where Yuki took the opportunity to clear up some things during their time alone. Before that, Q's mentioned he was going to pick up his grandfather, and the girl hugged him tightly to avoid being ignored, saying she missed her older brother a lot and wanted to be pampered right then and there. Q's played along for a moment but was interrupted when his grandfather called to say he had arrived. Finding the old man at the entrance, Q's joked that he looked like an Italian gangster in that white suit, to which his grandfather responded that he had forgotten to put on the sunglasses to complete the look. The young man asked where he had gotten the outfit, and the old man explained that he had spent all his retirement money to buy it for that day. Later, the grandfather asked if Kotaru was too busy to come that day, and Q's explained that he had been transferred to the Japanese embassy in England. In the middle of their discussion about idols, Alia appeared and was practically approached by Q's grandfather. The boy explained that the crazy old man was obsessed with Russia while trying to keep his grandfather in check. Next to her, Alia's mother finally introduced herself as Kujo Ami and mentioned that her daughter always talked about Q's at home. Embarrassed, Q's hoped it was only good things until he noticed that the grandfather had disappeared. The old man had wandered off to ask the Russian girl for her hand in marriage and to join their family, forcing Q's to regain control over the eccentric old man. Alia's mother also teased her about this marriage talk. After the meeting, Q's encountered a woman named Yuki, which triggered a heavy childhood memory. When greeted by Q's grandfather, she responded by calling him father-in-law. Transported back to a childhood memory, Q's runs to show Yuki the high score he achieved on a test, and she praises him enthusiastically. One day, during a stunning piano performance, Q's receives enthusiastic applause from the entire audience, but Yuki seems oddly unsettled. This makes young Q's realize that his performance wasn't enough to impress her, so he starts practicing even more intensively. However, contrary to what he expected, Yuki becomes irritated by the constant sound of the piano in the house and tells him to stop. With tears in his eyes, the young Misachika immediately ceases, unable to speak. At that moment, he wakes from a nightmare, and to make matters worse, he catches a cold. When someone rings the doorbell, he answers to find Alia. She learned from Yuki that her friend was ill and came to deliver medicine at Yuki's request. Hughes reflects that his eccentric sister could have given him a heads up, but now Alia is already there, asking to come in. Hughes responds that just the medicine is enough, almost pushing her out, but she insists that Yuki asked her to take care of him. Hughes then imagines that his sister is trying to involve others in her otaku fantasies until Alia admits in Russian that she wasn't being completely honest about coming only at Yuki's request. He then lets her into the house. Seeing Alia nervously standing at the door of the room, Hughes tells her to relax, but she responds irritably that everything feels a bit new to her, and in Russian, she adds that the room smells like a boy. She then asks if he prefers porridge or something else, maybe soup, since the vegetables are cooked until soft, making it easier to eat even when sick. He chooses soup, and she says it will take four hours to prepare. Hughes complains that's too long, and Alia admits that using a pressure cooker would speed things up, but it would be sacrilegious. So, Hughes opts for porridge instead, and Alia goes to prepare it, reading the recipe in the kitchen. She notices Q's using the mug she gave him, which makes her very happy. Some time later, with Misachika suffering from a high fever, the porridge is finally ready. Seeing his friend in an apron serving the bowl on a tray, he thanks her for the lovely sight, making the girl sarcastically respond that he seems to be feeling better. She then sits on the bed and hands him the porridge, asking if he can eat it by himself. Q's manages to eat without any trouble, takes a bite, and praises the taste. Embarrassed, the Russian girl doesn't respond properly to the compliment, as she's thinking of another question. She wants to know where Q's parents are. He explains that his father is at work and he doesn't have a mother. After finishing his meal and taking his medicine, Q's announces that he's going to sleep, so Alia can leave whenever she wants. The Russian girl responds that she'll be studying in the living room if he needs her, but that's not quite what he meant. He was trying to hint that it was time for her to go home, but she insists on being his full-time nurse and that's how things stay. After resting, Q's wakes up at 8 in the evening, assuming his friend has already left. However, when he opens the door, he finds Ayano there, in his house, next to the Russian girl dressed in her maid uniform. Seeing her boss awake, 
Ayano rushes to help him get up, but he warns her to be careful with that chest before being cancelled without reason. Alia isn't pleased with this conversation and tells Ayano to step back, but Ayano insists that helping the boss walk is part of her duties as a maid. The Russian girl responds that Ayano is Yuki's maid, not Kyuza's, making the girl swallow hard before explaining that her employer asked her to take care of Misachika. In other words, Elisa Kujo can leave the rest to her and go home. Kyuza is shocked by the girl's audacity in speaking to Alia like that, while the maid reminds her colleague that she needs to prepare for the next day. Hughes asks what's going on, but Alia dismisses it, saying she only has regular classes. Then she says goodbye and maintains her composure, asking Ayano to take care of Misachika before leaving. Later, Ayano serves the sick boy the soup Alia had prepared. After thanking her and tasting the soup, Hughes praises the food, making the girl blush slightly, just like the soup. After finishing his meal, around 9.30 in the evening, fatigue sets in, and the young man decides not to bother taking a bath before going to bed. In response, Ayano offers to clean him, but with a blindfold. Hughes replies that it's impossible to clean someone without seeing, so he lies down. The maid decides to sleep next to the patient or at least sing to him to help him fall asleep. Noticing her is full of energy, Hughes orders her to return to Yuki's house and end the night, a command she promptly follows. When he wakes up the next morning, Hughes feels much better. He finds the maid cleaning the floor at 11 in the morning and asks if she missed school because of him. Ayano responds that her boss's health is more important than a mere school report. With that, she goes to prepare lunch. While serving the food and placing the medicine on the table, Hughes notices something odd and asks to see the medicine's packaging. It says that drowsiness is a side effect, so he asks if Yuki sent Alia with this. The maid reveals the truth, and realizing what's happening, Hughes rushes to school and overhears two boys in the hallway saying that Yuki performed much better than Alia, making him realize he had let his guard down, thinking his sister wouldn't try anything until the closing ceremony. He rushes to Alia and asks what happened, and she apologizes for ruining everything. After calming down, she explains that it all started the previous morning, when Yuki asked to speak with her in the student council room. Yuki, saying she was busy, asked the Russian girl to take care of Misachika, giving her his usual medicine along with his address. Additionally, she invited Alia to join the lunch broadcast the next day, as she planned to discuss the recent student congress live. This would be Alia's chance to showcase her victory in the debate to everyone. The Russian girl responded that she didn't want to discuss it anymore, so Yuki asked her to forget that part but insisted she attend anyway, so they could prepare the final report of the first semester together. Under pressure, Alia eventually agreed, and then Yuki mentioned the rumor that Nan Noah was cheating which was spreading throughout the school. Amused that Alia was trying to bury her own victory in the Congress. For these reasons and more, Yuki adopted a villainous expression and commented that Alia was too relaxed. She sarcastically asked if Alia truly intended to win the elections, considering that the Russian girl didn't feel any danger entering her rival's territory. Yuki believed that this lack of survival instinct made Elisa Kujo such an easy target that she felt the need to give a warning. After all, Misachika was ill, so Alia should have been much more cautious. Scared, the Russian girl suddenly realized and asked if her rival was planning to take advantage of Kyuza's illness. Yuki admitted directly that she planned to use this moment to diminish her opponent's position as much as possible. At this point, Alia's initial shock turned into a determined look, warning that her enemy underestimated her if she thought she could play around just because Alia was alone. Yuki, somewhat shaken, said that Alia could ask Misachika for help whenever she wanted, but Alia retorted that she wouldn't be a burden to him. With that, Yuki declared that she was looking forward to seeing what the Ice Princess would be capable of the next day. After Yuki left, Elisa Kujo promised she wouldn't be defeated. While recounting this part of the story to Kyuze, she assured him that she had prepared as well as possible, but something happened after classes today, just before the live broadcast began. Yuki apologized for her behavior the previous day, with Alia explaining that she felt awful for plotting against such a dear friend. She confessed that she had taken too aggressive a stance, forcing herself to go all in, but now she realized she didn't want to ruin her friendship with Elisa Kujo. Not knowing how to respond, Alia said it was all right and asked Yuki to keep her head up, promptly accepting her apology. Relieved, Yuki admitted that, although it might seem like an apology, there was a significant reason she wanted so much to become president, and that reason was her older brother. This brother was far more talented than she could ever be, and their parents and grandparents expected him to elevate the Sioux family's name to a new level. However, one day he was gone, and now Yuki needed to carry the burden of meeting the expectations that once rested on him, finishing what he started. After sharing this story, the girls were informed that the program was about to go live. Taking advantage of the moment, Yuki asked why Alia wanted to become president. With the countdown to the live broadcast starting, Alia stammered, unsure how to respond, 
especially after the profound reason her opponent had just revealed. Despite this, the show began, with the student council spokesperson announcing another council activity and requesting the guests to introduce themselves. Alia, visibly nervous, took her time to introduce herself clumsily, giving Yuki the opportunity to tease her about her anxiety. After explaining the situation to Kyuz, Alia admitted that the broadcast was a disaster, and Kyuz was infuriated, realizing the extent of Yuki's scheming. Even so, he reassured Alia not to blame herself, as Yuki's aim was precisely to unsettle her. Since the broadcast was in the morning and only a few students were at school, Yuki wasn't trying to prove she was better to everyone. She was aiming to mess with Alia's mindset, and she succeeded. Realizing that her rival had caught them off guard, Kyuz laughed, excited for the competition for the first time. In other words, things were about to get serious. Alia, in Russian, found herself captivated by the determined look on his face. Later, she lamented that she only wanted to be president for her own sake. Hughes pulled her out of that thought, reminding her that even though her motivation might not be as noble as Yuki's, it was still compelling, honest, and hardworking. Therefore, she should hold her head high and not feel inferior to her opponent. Alia joked that his speech sounded more like a love declaration, and Kyuz gave up, but Alia admitted that his words restored her confidence, even though Yuki carried the spirit of her deceased brother. That said, Kyuz, while appearing calm, was internally furious with his sister for making the school think he was dead. He tried to explain the truth, but Nan Noah entered with Taniyama, both apologizing for their actions at the Congress. Taniyama also wanted to know if Alia had omitted his name from the broadcast to protect his reputation, but Alia replied she didn't want to claim victory in a Congress she didn't win. Conversely, Taniyama believed he lost and wanted to announce his defeat during the closing ceremony. Hughes suggested an alternative approach, and after explaining the plan, Nan Noah and Taniyama decided to support Alia's candidacy. With that resolved, Kyuz declared they now had a genuine chance to win the election and vowed to defeat Yuki mercilessly, as a matter of honor. In the days that followed, he and his partner concentrated on practical presentation rehearsal. On the final day of practice before the trimester ended, in the auditorium, Q assured the girl that she was prepared and only needed to repeat the training during the actual event. However, Alia wasn't as confident. Despite her strong performance at the student congress, she believed it was only because she was lost in her own thoughts. Plus, the audience for tomorrow would be even larger. Q didn't deny it and confirmed that the auditorium would be packed with people, but he stressed that this didn't change what she needed to do. She just had to focus on delivering her message. Still, the Russian girl doubted it would work, admitting that she came to this realization after watching Q speak at the Congress. She didn't think she had the same ability as him to engage the audience. Q was candid, saying he didn't know where his talent came from but that much of it came from experience. On that note, he shared a tip with Alia to help break the ice and capture the audience's attention. After hearing this advice, Alia Kujo decided to give it a try. On the day of the presentation, Yuki suddenly showed up and commented that Masachika had a menacing expression. He responded that someone had tried to mock him, but that the mask of the provocateur would soon fall. Q also confirmed that Yuki was exactly like that and warned Alia not to be fooled. Yuki asked if the Russian girl was upset with her, but Alia said there was no reason to be as it's normal for people to act differently in different situations. Alia then questioned if Yuki was sincere when she said she wanted them to remain friends, to which Yuki cynically answered, yes. Alia, however, expressed her hope that this was true, as Yuki had given her the opportunity to reflect on herself. After all, Yuki had challenged why C. Joe wanted to become student council president, and Alia planned to have an answer for her the next day. The council spokesperson remarked that Alia's straightforward nature had finally surfaced, making her a fascinating individual. Q sarcastically commented that he was delighted they were still friends, to which his sister playfully replied that she also loved keeping her friendship with him. She then asked if Q was upset with her, but he believed that targeting an opponent's weaknesses was an obvious tactic. To sum up his feelings about his sister, it was like wanting to both scold your dog for trying to bite you but also teach it a lesson so it doesn't attempt it again. In this case, Yuki had taken a bite but missed her chance to fully sink her teeth in. Shortly after, Kenzaki entered, breaking the tension in the room, with Sarah and Masha eager to review one final detail for the next day. He asked about the speech order, recalling how last year's candidates had played Russian roulette to decide. In reality, it was rock-paper-scissors. You didn't think rock-paper-scissors would work because it's easy to read your opponent. Yuki then suggested flipping a coin, and Masha offered to toss it. The rule was simple. If Alia guessed correctly, she could choose who would go first. If not, Yuki would decide. 
Without hesitation, the coin was tossed, and Yuki began to strategize. If she spoke first and made a strong impact, Alia would follow with the audience already off balance. If she spoke second, the first speaker might only receive polite applause, giving the audience time to think, which wasn't an option. Yuki wanted a complete, overwhelming victory so she needed to speak first. On the other hand, it might be smart to let her brother go first since he was so skilled. She also noticed that he had gone out of his way to intimidate her, which was unlike him since he usually avoided attention. In any case, the coin landed in Masha's hand, and it was time for Alia to decide. Without a second thought, Alia called heads, but the coin came up tails, meaning Yuki got to choose who would speak first. Yuki wondered whether her brother's threat was genuine or just a distraction. It seemed like Masachika was trying to regain control after seeing Alia almost in tears from being humiliated. Knowing how emotionally fragile the Russian girl was, he was likely trying to protect her. With Alia still shaken by yesterday's broadcast, Yuki calculated that the pressure would become unbearable if Alia had to speak last, especially since Masachika's goal was probably to speak first and receive polite applause, giving the impression of a tie. With everything settled, Yuki chose to go first. The next day, during the closing ceremony, it was time for the student council presentations. President Kaki Toya and the other council members made remarks about the trimester before summer break arrived. Finally, the presidential candidates took the stage. As previously decided, Yuki was the first to speak. The lights dimmed, and a spotlight illuminated the podium. Yuki asked if Ayano was ready, and her assistant confirmed she was. With that, Yuki stepped up, greeted the students, and introduced herself as a candidate for next year's student council president. Afterward, some students voiced their support for her. Yuki then presented her first proposal. If elected, she would create a school that seriously considered student input through a suggestion box. Although the school had had one for years, few students used it, and Yuki understood this was because no one believed real change would occur, which made sense since most council members were preoccupied with the demands of their new roles, so absorbed in their tasks that they neglected student concerns. However, Yuki assured the crowd that she would bring these ideas to life. For example, she proposed changes to sports competitions, adjustments to school festival events, and even the introduction of new events like Halloween or Christmas. She had already served as student council president in middle school and now in high school, with the experience and background to support her, Yuki is confident that she's uniquely positioned to make all of this happen. With that, Yuki Su thanks the audience for their attention and wraps up her presentation. Backstage, Q comments that her speech was full of vague promises without anything solid, but Kenzaki admits that, regardless, it was an impressive speech and Yuki is better than he could ever be. Masha asks if her sister is alright, and Yuki replies that she is but prefers to be left alone for now. Next up, Kimishima Ono takes the podium and introduces herself as Yuki's running mate. Outside of school, she works as Yuki Su's personal assistant and considers her boss to be someone with incredible talent, impeccable behavior, and a deep sense of empathy and kindness. Behind the scenes, Q remarks that these girls are trying to secure victory before Alia even gets a chance to participate, but the Russian girl stays focused. He remembers that this part of the event is the student council leader's address, an ideal moment for Alia to introduce herself to the audience and allow them to get to know her. Meanwhile, Ayano finishes praising Yuki and ends her speech, with both girls receiving well-earned applause from the audience. Now, it's Alyssa Kujo's turn, the student council treasurer. As Alia walks up to the podium, the audience is still buzzing from the previous speeches, believing the election is already decided. Then, Alia catches everyone off guard by taking a deep breath and starting her speech in Russian. This move shocks everyone, drawing their full attention as she speaks in her native language for several moments. Finally, she switches back to Japanese, explaining that her nerves got the better of her, which is why she started in Russian. The audience is unsure if it was a joke, leading to a few chuckles. The day before, Q had suggested this tactic to Alia, advising her that, if they were going second, she should begin her speech in Russian to pull the audience's focus away from the previous candidate. So, Alia Kujo begins her real speech, acknowledging that she doesn't yet have a political record to boast about, as she only recently transferred to the school. She also admits that she doesn't fully understand all the council's duties or face-to-face -face responsibilities, but she's not afraid to take them on because there's one thing she's certain of. Alia is someone who works harder than anyone else and always strives to give her best to achieve her ideal goals. She believes that people should never rest after accomplishing something but should always aim for more. While Alia's ambition sometimes causes tension, 
leading to failure, she has learned from her mistakes and helped her class win the award for best attraction at last year's festival. Of course, she didn't do it alone, and she acknowledges that she still has much to improve in order to become a strong student council president. As she shares these thoughts, Alia recalls when Q told her how driven, serious, and hardworking she is, which is why she must keep moving forward. She continues, saying that despite her flaws, she had the courage to stand before everyone and speak from the heart, promising to make up for any shortcomings step by step. She vows that if she doesn't feel capable of fulfilling her role, she will withdraw her candidacy. But until then, she asks for everyone to pay attention to her political efforts. As her speech ends, the audience's applause grows steadily. Huma Sachika congratulates his partner, telling her it's time to win, and takes the stage. The first thing he does is announce that he was the one behind the scenes running things when Yuki was president. With this, he strikes a pose as the low-key protagonist working from the shadows, making the audience burst into laughter. As the atmosphere lightens, he confirms that he really was Yuki Su's vice president and suspects that everyone is wondering why he isn't running with her again. The truth is, he let her go because the ideal student council president should be someone with the charisma to inspire others. As strange as Alia's speech may have seemed, Q insists it was both genuine and heartfelt, which is why he chose to support the Russian girl instead of Yuki. To further prove the growing support for Alia, Q announces that Taniyama and Nanoa will be joining the council as officers once Alia is president. Yes, former debate rivals will now be working together. With that, Q brings the two onto the stage, leaving the audience in disbelief. The four members of their team thank everyone for their support, receiving enthusiastic applause from the crowd. Q tells Alia that she is the one responsible for this accomplishment. After this, Taniyama declares that she and Alia are now even and reminds her that she won't be helping with the campaign anymore, unlike Nanoa, who says she will continue to support the new president, though she mispronounces Alia's name by mistake. Looking directly at her rival, the Russian girl reflects on how she will become president and won't be under Yuki's control anymore. On the other side, Yuki acknowledges her defeat in this round, though the overall battle isn't finished yet. Later on, Q discovers that he ranked 33rd in the school's grade average, meaning he lost the bet that he would make it into the top 30 and now has to do whatever Alia asks. In Russian, the girl expresses disappointment, saying she had hoped he would win because that's what she wanted. Embarrassed, Q requests that she call him by his first name, explaining that they are now recognized as a united team. With that, Alia calls him Misachika, and both blush, unsure of where to look as they leave the school together. Misachika mentions that they'll need to start preparing for the election even during summer break. In Russian, Alia asks him to look at her and replies that it would be her great pleasure. And that's how the anime of the Russian girl ends. My dear, if you enjoyed it, please leave a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. It means a lot to me. Also, check out the next recap that's popping up on the screen. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.